Good evening and welcome to Tata Literature Live Business Chapters. This is a series in which we invite business leaders and management gurus to share their insights, vision, and expertise through conversations and discussions. Our previous sessions have been uh, attended by lots and lots of people, and we thank the audience for joining in such numbers. Today's event brings together two very distinguished management gurus. They're almost like legends, actually. Uh, Arun Mehra, former member of the Planning Commission and former chairman of Boston Consulting Group India. We'll be in conversation with Arun Das, former director general of CII and former chairman of Institute of Economic Growth. They will discuss Arun Mehra's latest book, the Learning Factory, how the leaders of Tata became nation builders. Do send your questions for the speakers. Five selected questions will get gift coupons from Tata Click. Over to you, Arun Das. Thank you very much, Anil. Arun, it's great to be with you. And um, I'm going to start this conversation with you with a question about you, the author, because there are on your book, on the book cover, there are three different segments. The top of the cover is Arun Myra, and then the name title of the book, and then there's a subtitle. So in two minutes, tell us something about Arun Myra, which we don't know. Um, Sarun, you might know a lot about me and it's a pleasure to be with you, but I'm going to share things which you might know, as I said, but I'd like to share them with uh, whoever is listening to our conversation today. I was born in Lahore in 1943, before the independence and the partition of India. My parents were both very young people, uh, were inspired by the spirit of the freedom movement. Uh, my father had built, in his 20s, a very successful uh, manufacturing enterprise uh, outside Lahore and was doing extremely well. Um, several cars, a Tonga in the family and a big house and so on. And uh, Lahore, uh, one wasn't sure till almost the 15th of August whether it be in India or it would be on the other side in Pakistan. And so on the 14th of August, he was able to leave um, through a lot of chaos um, and violence to come on this side towards India in his shorts and, uh, and a shirt. Uh, and he had to start all over again. And so he was given, like the refugees were given some compensation, got some land allotted to build a factory in UP of all places uh, in uh, new independent India. And it was very difficult to start again um, with all the bureaucracy that had come in at that time and there were shortages and you had to uh, line up to get quotas for steel and labor inspectors and excise inspectors and so on. So I saw him struggle, but he never lost his spirit. He wanted to build uh, the India that he had, you know, sung about as a young person, Sarfaroshi Ki Tamanna, get the British out and we we'll build our country. My mother was a, a very inspiring person and an educated woman. She had done a science at the Lahore College for Women and was given uh, um, a prize, which was one of the first um, editions of Mahatma Gandhi's uh, autobiography, uh, story of his experiments with truth. When she passed away in uh, 19, uh, well, two years ago at 97, um, she reminded me that uh, when I was uh, just four, in January 1948 or turning five, she had taken me to Mahatma Gandhi's prayer meeting in Delhi, two days before he was assassinated. And she said, after the meeting, when all the crowd rushed to get his blessing, he said, bring the little children forward. And you were a little fellow, I put you in front and he touched your forehead. And remember that, she said, you have been touched by Mahatma Gandhi. And by the way, what I'm leaving for you, like a will, was this autobiography, the copy that she had. It's all worn out and it's lying here now with me. So this was the spirit in which I grew up and then I got a scholarship, fortunately. My father wasn't able to earn enough in those early days to send me to a good school. So I got a Government of India scholarship to go to the Lawrence School Sanaa, a fine school, and a Government of India scholarship to go through St. Stephen's College. At that time, the young people who were doing well in their academics, like in St. Stephen's, all aspire to 
join the civil services because that is the way we thought was the only way to serve the country, to build uh, the country. Uh, however, the principle of St. Stephen suggested I go interview with Tatars for the Tata Administrative Service, where the directors told me that when uh, Jamshed Ji Tata was you know, struggling to build industries uh, in India, and earlier than Mahatma Gandhi's time with the political struggle, Mahatma Gandhi later said that while Mahatma Gandhi was fighting for India's political freedom, Jamshed Ji Tata had been fighting for India's economic of freedom. And he's, they said we do this by building factories in which we produce things which the British feel we cannot and should not produce, but we are going to make them and do them ourselves to build our strength and employ people in the country because we need employment in good skilled work. So that's the spirit. So if you want to build India, come and work with Tatars. So that's how I got to Tatars. Thank you. Thank you. That's an amazing story. I'm so glad I asked you that question. Actually, we could probably spend the whole session just talking about your life story. Uh, the book title, Arun, The Learning Factory, how did you, this is a very unique uh, book title. Where did it come from? What's the, is it your publisher? Is it you? Is it a combination? Uh, tell, what's behind that title, The Learning Factory? Actually, it's a term which uh, um, I have used in the book because it was a term that Sumant Mulgaonkar, who built up Telco, the Tata Engineering Locomotive Company, which has then become Tata Motors, and several other engineering enterprises of Tata's, and helped the Singapore government also build their industrial uh, capabilities in the 1960s and 70s. He used to use this term, the learning factory. And in Pune, where we were given this uh, large piece of uh, land by the government of India, government of Maharashtra, to build a factory uh, in which we would produce trucks and buses built by Indians. The machines also would have to be designed and built by Indians and trucks to be designed in future by Indians, earlier designed by Daimler-Benz. And uh, we had to do it all by ourselves. So what he said was that what we are building in Pune is not a truck. We are building a learning factory in which young people in this country who have never done these things before, we will hire, find people from schools whose parents have been in agriculture, who have never been in a factory, get these kids trained in three or four years in the finest training school that we built in Pune, and learning to work the finest machines in engineering. We will get young Indians from the IITs who just read engineering in a classroom and put them to work to learn how to build production systems, employing those other young Indians that I mentioned to you who came out of schools learning how to work machines. Everyone's going to be learning together, he said. The workmen, the young managers. And when I said, sir, I'm so young, you're putting me in charge of this operation, or the, the, the development of the learning side, the manpower side, the human side of this enterprise. I don't know how to do this. What can I tell these people? I myself don't know. He said, Myra, remember, you are not going there to teach anybody. You also are going there to learn. learn. You are going to learn to do something you've never done before, just like they are learning to do something they've never done before. And together, you will learn and teach each other, and we'll build a learning factory. So that's how the term came. So the publishers, as they read the book, and you know, I thought some other titles, they said, no, this is so striking. This book has to be called The Learning Factory. It's a very, very striking title. And that's why I thought we need to know the background. The other uh, bit on the on the cover page under the title is leaders of Tatars became nation builders. This is a very big statement. You're talking about a company, a private sector company and their leaders. And you're saying they became nation builders. Can you explain that? Yes. Uh, see, Tarun, as I said, I got attracted to join Tatars, though I was not at all like the most people who did well in, in St. Stephen's College uh, those days would never think of joining businesses because they thought businesses were about making money, you know, producing a lot of simple things, you know, boxes, yeah. and soaps and stuff and selling them and making money. You're not building a country. And so they wouldn't think of it, you see. So 
but that is the story that i heard as i told you about what mahatma gandhi said about uh, uh, the, the tatars uh, that yes they were building a country and i joined tatars and i heard jrd tata who was the chairman of the group then and you know he was chairman for 50 years was you know in his best at the time when uh, in the 60s when i joined tatars and he used to say this and it was tough times for india business people needed help from the government to do so many things but he said whenever he had a dilemma and had to take a difficult decision he first asked himself what is good for india and then what would be good for tatars and he said whenever he took the decision which would be good for india it would turn out to be good for tatars somewhere somewhere down the road and so that was the orientation of uh, the leaders of tatars mr jr tata the chair and sumit mulkarkar and others now that's an orientation what i learned from working with sumit mulkarkar uh, under sumit mulkarkar was how to make this orientation concrete because you build uh, your country by building the society of your country by building the skills in people so they can learn and earn more by building strong communities in which people care for each other have better sanitation education and a public health for themselves build also the environment that is the uh, ecological environment around you so i'm saying build the environment we got this factory in pune with nothing on it just stones it was uh, several hundred acres i think a couple of thousand acres with nothing on it just stones no bushes even no trees and what sumit mulgarkar said was that look what society needs what a country needs to be a healthy country is healthy economy skilled people and it needs well forests and resources it needs resources and he sent me this sent us this quote and reminded us that some economist had said that all the resources that are required for building uh, a healthy industrial uh, country the two that take the longest to grow are a body of skilled persons and a stand of timber so we will start with these first even before we start putting investment into machines so with that orientation you know he insisted that we would somehow find a way to grow trees on that rocky barren soil we said okay we'll dig pits we'll bring soil and find the sort of trees which can grow in that sort of climate but we needed water so when we started using some of the water that was allocated for the industry by the government for the trees we were taken to task that you illegal us factory manager can get arrested you're not supposed to use this water for looking after trees because those days remember i'm talking about the 60s and 70s yeah. industry hardly anywhere and even it, this environmental movement is much more recent never thought that caring for trees and the environment and the birds was something that one should be responsible for but sumul mulgaon ko ensured we did that as well as i said building the skilled people and in the villages around us we did not build a colony like in jamshedpur you know providing houses to our people building schools for them and hospitals for them as we done in jamshedpur he said no our people will live with their communities in the villages and they'll come to work see standards of work here in the factory and cleanliness and feel that they must improve their own villages but they will be leaders of cooperative efforts in their own communities so we facilitated the creation of some 50 cooperative associations in the villages around us led by tata workers and some of them went on then you know to become mlas and even mps because they learned leadership of leading in a community to help the community to produce what it needed as i said good education good health good sanitation and so on so we were building communities building the environment building leaders that's how we were building india as it were though we were building a factory and it was a terrific factory yeah it was yeah. the best in india and people came from all over the world to come and see how could indians have built a factory like this humming and so efficient a fascinating story fascinating one of the things that's always troubled me arun in my uh, long association with industry is that uh, society doesn't trust industry and uh, there is a there is a 
distance between industry and the common man as it were and yet your chapter 6 of your book is therefore very fascinating for me because the chapter says trusted by the people can you talk about that yes um, uh, uh, tarun first um, uh, trust i, I learned uh, that tatas were trusted um when i was um, coming back from singapore from uh, a business visit that i was sent on to help as i mentioned to you uh, with the singapore government on building their training schools in singapore in the late 1960s um you know customs people used to harass everyone who came back you know anything you got they'd open up your suitcase rip it apart because they thought you were you know smuggling something and people were yeah. and they were you know bringing in transistors and uh, in those days and then passing on some money to the customs officer this was all racket going on and i said i'm nothing to declare uh, that is dutiable because i've got a lot of little, little souvenirs for people uh, for the staff in the office and it's a long list here and it's not worth very much and here's the the prices of it the the customs fellow said this can't be this fellow's you know hiding something under there and he embarrassed me completely by throwing my little little stuff all over and people behind me were laughing and saying imagine this fellow's gone abroad and is buying pens at a chinese store for you know staff in the office and so on and this senior officer from the customs came because he saw this uh, confusion and he asked uh, what's going on and the junior fellow said sir this fellow's not telling us what he's got and look uh, he's got so many things but he says they're worth only so much and so on so forth so the senior fellow just said to me he said uh, where do you work i said sir i work in tatas you know what he said he turned to the junior officer he said if he works in tata he's work he works in tata then if he says this is worth only 450 rupees all of this stuff it is worth only 450 rupees people in tatas always tell the truth so i'm saying a customs officer in bombay he wasn't working for tatas but that's the reputation tatas had and i realized what one had to live up to in one's work that this trust was earned by people before me for tatas our brand and we by our actions had to be trustworthy and the other story then i learned later which is again the humility of tatas of jrd and sumul magaka they wouldn't themselves talk about it in malaysia where i was sent up to help build uh, and uh, uh, our enterprise there to uh, produce and sell trucks and buses in malaysia uh, the german partners of my chairman the the, the prince there um old gentleman came and to his house and then they i was introduced to them as a person from tatas and they said look tunku to the prince we want to tell you a story about the reputation tatas have in germany with cross mapai he they said that when the war finished in 1945 when germany was you know yeah uh, ruled by the americans and the british um the german companies especially cross mapai was an armaments company it had all these sanctions it, it couldn't do anything make any contracts with anybody jardi tata and sumut mulgaonko came to munich and the board of cross mafai on the station in munich requested them to please take our skilled workers and their families they're starving here in germany there's no work they're not allowed to work because the company was not allowed to function please take them with you feed them take care of them and they'll teach you the skills they know and they were the finest cross mafai the finest uh, uh, you know craftsmen in the engineering industry in the world so they came to india and tatas employed them provided houses for their families schools for them and looked after them and we learned from them after the war was over and we were independent so this gentleman said a letter was received by the board of uh, cross mafia in germany from someone in india they said long unpronounceable name it seems it was someone from gaonka saying that now that we can legally pay you we would like to pay you for the technology that we have learned from you and they said look there was no obligation there was no legal contract but they felt that they had to do something in fairly in fairness for us if we were down and out don't take advantage of us and give back to us so this is how tatas earned their trust they gave their word and they did the fair thing and they lived up to their word always that's what i learned anyway so there was trust in tatas for sure but tarun like i said when i finished college there wasn't trust in business anyway yeah. so tatas were an exception thank you thank you arun thank you for that amazing anecdote now there are two chapters in your book 
workers and shareholders, shareholders and workers. Um, these are also very interesting facets of uh, the way you, the Tata's handled workers, and Tata's handled shareholders. Can I get you to talk about that? Yes, uh, Tarun. Uh, you know, I was, as I said, uh, a young person uh, growing up and then later leading the, the operations in Pune. Um, and it was built on by the people. Uh, workers, they had done tough things, they had learned things that they hadn't known before. And together we had created this, this enterprise. It was their efforts that had put, if I could say, Telco on the global map, because we were by that time in the 19, uh, uh, late 1970s and early 80s, already exporting trucks and buses designed by us in, in India, produced in our factories in India, like I said, to 50 countries around us, competing with Daimler-Benz, who had been our teachers before. You know, so we had built, or these workers had built, and the young engineers had built uh, the, the company. So, well, industries go through recessions uh, for various circumstances, and the truck industry certainly has, you know, long cycles of ups and then downs. And in a recession, um, you have to, you know, cut your, uh, your cash, manage your cash. Because you, you can't get paid, you're not selling things. So you, board had to decide at the end of that year, it's a bad year, um, the dividend is a discretionary expense. I mean, you don't need to pay dividends. It's after all, in case the company made the profit, then you can. So you can save your cash on the dividends. And similarly, the bonus to employees is supposed to be if the company makes a profit and the workers have uh, contributed towards it, then you can give them a bonus. They're both discretionary. So if there is a cash shortage, the two things that should easily, I mean, there's nothing. Um, you're depriving anybody because in any case, the deal is that if we make a profit, we pass on some to you. So you stop the dividend and you stop the bonus. Now, my job was to explain to the workers that uh, they could not be bonus that year. And of course, they depended on the bonus. It was not a thing on top at the end of the year with which you went and bought something fancy. It was a, something that they put into their budgets and they you know, paid for schools, education and so on with it. So cutting the bonus for the workers, though it was justified, was going to hurt them was going to hurt them. But I got surprised. I was on the board. So I got the board papers before the meeting. And I saw that we were going to pay the dividend, continue paying the dividend. But we were going to cut the bonus, which we'd already explained to the workers. So I told Sumant Murgaanko, I called and I said, sir, I don't think this is right. So he said, you know, I agree with you. My, my feeling is you're probably right. However, Nani Palkiwala and the finance people have convinced me that we have to maintain the dividend. If you feel so strongly about it, would you go and discuss this with Nani Palkiwala? Now, Nani Palkiwala had won on those cases in the Supreme Court for the fundamental rights of, of all Indians. And for me to go and debate with him about the, the rights of one set of society vis-a-vis -vis another was a tough thing. So I went to his office, it was set up as Mulgarka, and I explained to him. I said, sir, why I, because he was a good listener. He said, why do you feel so? I said, sir, I'm sorry, I just come from you with the workers only, and I see what they do. They give their lives, they work 24 by 7 almost sometimes when you know, times are tough, all the time. And shareholders, as far as I know, don't even know what the money is being used for, whether the money has gone into a company that's producing, I don't know, trucks or buses or cars, they wouldn't even know. So what, how are they vested in this company? What have they given really, and why should we be honoring their needs for a dividend when we are not able to honor the needs of the workers for a bonus. So he got it, but he explained to me the whole sort of world of business and finance, how we could not disappoint uh, the, the investors because then we wouldn't be able to raise more money, uh, which we needed, and so on. So I, I got all that, but he got the point. So he said, you know, what has struck me is what you said, that the investors don't even know what their company does. Hmm? It's just a stock, it's a symbol, and you put it and you watch it, how it go up and down and take money out when you think it might do badly and put it in when you think it might do well. But the workers, as you said, have really done this. I don't think our shareholders have had the experience of what it's like to be in a worker's shoes and to build something. So what he arranged with Suman Mugankar was, well, the board did take the decision to pay the dividend because taken already, and there's good reason to do that. And we did not pay the bonus because we'd convinced the workers and they had accepted it. But 
we put something into a welfare budget, which the workers then used to organize meetings of themselves and their families to which they invited the managers, like off-sites, they said, to keep strengthening uh, the, the fraternity, the, the community. And that was their investment, to keep building what they so treasured, that, you know, we feel a solid uh, community together, a family, a team together. So they put their welfare monies into, into that, to, to those uh, meetings and events and picnics for their families. He arranged, Suman Mulgaukar, that the shareholders would be brought by special trains to the factory in Pune, given, you know, good meals and taken around like VIPs to see what the workers actually did. And it was quite startling to see uh, how some work uh, shareholders treated the workers. They come in there and walking through the factories find like this uh, a beautiful thing lying on a worker producing it, take it, put it into uh, their, their bags. And the worker or the supervisor would say, sir, don't take that's a very important piece of a machine. And he said, who are you? You work here? I own the company. This is mine. This actually happened. Fortunately, another man, another shareholder walking alongside turned to this shareholder and said, how many shares do you own? So he said some number. He said, oh, I own many more than that. I'm telling you, you put it back. This is more my company than yours. So this argument about whose company is it? And Tarun, today uh, I was reading some statistics, how things have changed. I'm talking now about that that is about 1980s in India. That yes, the shareholders did have money in the company for a long time. Nani Palkiwala pointed out that many of the Tata shareholders are widows and pensioners. And they just depend on those dividends, please. So Myra, think about them also. Put yourself in their shoes, which I've learned to do. But times have changed. Shareholders then in the United States at that time used to keep uh, the investment in a share, in a stock, for about an average, it says, about nine or ten months. By the 1990s, the average time that a shareholder kept money in a, in a company was a few days only, a few days, because you know, trading was much faster. You know, last year, 19, uh, the, the, the last data statistics, it is average time is 22 seconds. I mean, when you say these are the owners of the company, because they are the investors, they don't know what they own and they yeah. don't care. They just want their money to make money. You see, money to make money. So this when you say, you know, the business of the business is to produce a wealth for shareholders. But who's producing the wealth? It's the hard work of the people who manipulate the machines, who use the materials, get efficiency out of the whole production system. They're producing the profits for those shareholders. So this yeah. has struck me always that it's, Stakeholders together, like J.R.D. Tata and Sumul Mugaka would say, yeah, the community is part of it and investors also are part of it. But who owns the company? Whose company is it? Is a big question for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Harun, India has the largest population of young people in the world, under 25, under 30. Uh, people say 600 million, 700 million young people. And there's an inspirational chapter in your book, the chairman and the trainee. <laughs> the chairman and the trainee. Uh, I think, will you talk about that? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that is a very precious story because Jyadi um, uh, Tata, who was, as I said, uh, the chairman for so long, and he gave, uh, uh, he found people who were wanting to build uh, India, build industries in India, like Sumant Mughal, and he gave them their head, you know, okay, the board and I will support you, go do it. It's tough, but get it done. And Darbari say it in chemicals, for example, similarly, uh, did tough things and built industries which uh, India needed and were very tough to build them in those days. So GRD would leave it to people, but he was a great stickler for uh, standards and also a great stickler that people need to be respected. Mm -hmm. So he heard that uh, when Sumudh Mughalka was starting the right way by building a training school. And so the um, factory hadn't even come up then. So he came on a visit to Pune and uh, he was taken through the training school. Now we had a tradition there, which we picked up from Jamshedpur where we had a first training school, that the most skilled trainees who did the very best in their three years or four years before they left the training school, were given the privilege of doing some project to produce something which is really intricate by themselves. And the next VVIP who came, this best training would 
give that object, so obviously it didn't belong to the trainee because all the materials belong to the company and the machines, but give it to this VVIP on behalf of all the trainees. Hmm? So GRD Tata was given a spinner, a tranquilizer, and I'm just putting one up here, a smaller one I have, which was given to me when I moved on from Tata's. It's a very intricate uh, device carved out of a piece of stainless steel. It's on gimbals and it can keep rotating on and on and on if you touch it and call the spinner or the tranquilizer. It is, they said, for busy executives who can get under stress, put it on your table and touch it. It will calm you down. Made out of the stainless steel, a beautiful thing. Hmm? So he was given this GRD Tata by a trainee. He went away. As Sumun Magalka said, many months later, nine, ten months later, GRD Tata walks down into Sumun Magalka's office in Bombay House with two brown paper bags and puts them on his table. And Sumun Magalka bit startled, but they were friendly. Hmm? So, he said, so what's it, Jay? He puts them down and he takes out from one brown paper bag one spinner on the table. Then, out of the other one, he takes an identical spinner, completely identical. And he said, Suman, one of these was the one that the trainees in Telco in Pune gave me, and the other is one I've made by myself. He had a workshop also in his house in Ottoman Road, and he made one himself. So he was, I think, by that time, in the late 60s probably, well, in the 60s for sure, that, you know, the trainee who was 17 years old could do it. I, at this age, can also do it. <laughs> That's it. So it was, you know, blue-collar work. This is the whole thing. And GRD was great, and so was Samund Mugavka. I mean, GRD would get under uh, air conditioner and repair it when the Volta's repairman came and say, look, I want to tell you how to do it properly. You know, do it. It's not about uh, the blue-collar work is demeaning and it's done only by people who are not educated. You have respect for for workers, respect for the work they do. Yeah, they were willing to work with their hands. Arun, as you know, and you've been involved uh, in this, I've worked all my life in an institution. Of course, much of that time I was surrounded by people from Tata's. Um, one of my programs, the chairman was Mr. J.R.D. Tata, and of course, Ratan and Jamshed Irani and many others. Um, in your uh, book, you write about this. You write about building an institution. And um, one never thinks of a company as an institution, you know. So when, I, when you're re writing about Tata's, which is a company, a group, a business group, and you're dedicating, uh, you're devoting a chapter to the subject building an institution, that's very interesting. So would you talk about that, Arun? Yes, thank you. You know, Tarun, um, um, I, I've been in government uh, subsequently, uh, and, you know, we, we need to build institutions in this country, many institutions. And I found that, um, and I find people even in the education sector in our country and so on, they want to build an institution. The, the first things, and that sometimes the only thing they think about is where's the land and the building and the size of it, and, you know, get a good architect to do it. And they get all of that and say, look, I've built an institution. And actually, uh, you don't need the the, the building and the land perhaps that much. It's the people and the way things are done. That's the institution. It's the norms, it's the values, it's the way things are done, it's the culture. That is the institution. To build the institution, therefore, you got to have a goal about what sort of people you're going to be, what sort of work you're going to do, and for whom you're doing it. And in public service, it has to be for whom is this institution? Whose needs will this institution serve? Whose needs will this serve? You start from that angle. And so I did feel that even in government, when we keep saying we have to reform institutions, we keep talking about the inefficiency of the government institution. And reform means have fewer people in them or have some technology in them and you know, make them more efficient. But that doesn't make an institution, to my mind. You start with whose needs have to be served, how will they be served, what sort of orientations and skills must be required by those who are now in that public service to provide that. Gandhiji spirit, I mean, Gandhiji built institutions. Honestly, I mean, the Congress party, as he did start, he was very careful that it's about the values of that institution that builds Congress as an institution. It's not about the buildings and the names on the buildings that makes it a great institution. 
So this is um, um, essential that we get our orientation right. In fact, I tell all the young people, and many of them come to me now, they're building great movements of change in this country and, and educational movements of helping other young people to learn to be leaders, to serve uh, the people. And they say, I need a budget, I need donors. I said, what for? Oh, you see, but, uh, you know, the land is going to cost this. If you get land for free, then the building that. As you're starting the wrong way, you need people. You need people. What do you need the capital for? If you're just going to be building with people. Think of the institution as people who are doing things together, which they want to do and doing them in an excellent way to serve others. That is an institution. Great, great. I, I needed you to talk about that because many people don't understand fully what is an institution and it's so important in our society, in our country. Take you to a very different uh, aspect of your book, Postcards to JRD Tata. <laughs> uh, well, postcards to yes. Uh, you know, Tarun, today is the 10th of December. It is Shama's and mine, 54th wedding anniversary. Wow, congratulations. Post <laughs> postcards are, uh, 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 you know, people writing to JRD Tata. And my last chapter in the book is um, the interactions of JRD Tata and Sumun Mugak and even Nani Palkiwala with human beings. They listen to, they listen to, uh, to, to human beings. Hmm? But the postcards that are in the chapter earlier were not me and my family talking to these great people, but all anybody who was with Tatas could approach them, could approach them, write a postcard to JRD if they felt, if the person felt that he or she, uh, something was going wrong in his or her life and that the company wasn't doing something right, wasn't doing something right. And you write a postcard to JRD Tata, these would arrive every week, um, and dozens of them to his office and I was sitting in that office in the Bombay house and my colleague Gargil was the officer assigned amongst other things to read all the postcards that came and to write to the managing director of the company concerned. The chairman has received this. He would like to know what has been done on this particular case and more importantly, how come that your company's HR processes allowed this to happen or could not prevent this from happening. Now, the second question was building the institution as it was, the important question. But the first was, of course, uh, examination of the complaint that the person had particularly made. So these were postcards that came to him on various matters from various companies. And his questions to everybody, what is wrong with your process, I think was the one on which he wanted the answer. And, you know, I learned, therefore, from the answers that came and his questioning even those answers what it meant to build systems which cared for the values of Tata's and respected people. He got one postcard, and I think that is the story in this. Yeah. When we were building Telco, and you know, we had only men, uh, young men, uh, skilled workers, blue collar workers, and engineers who were all men in India those days. But we, and we were looking for the best engineers in the country and got the best from all the IITs. A woman applied, it seems. Uh, she did, and she was told that though she was very good, she could not be hired for the job she wanted to do, which was on the shop floor. She wanted to be an engineer working with machines and with people who are working machines. And she was told, I'm sorry, we can't give you that training for that job. Why? Not because you're not good, you're extremely good, but we don't have provisions for toilets for women on the shop floors and you know you'll have to work shifts also and maybe not safe for you to rotate into uh, late evening and night shifts. She wrote a postcard to GRD Tata, this lady, um, and said that you know I want to be working doing this and what's wrong with me and I'm told I can't. So he calls Suman Smulgaoka who says you talk directly to Myra, he's in charge. <laughs> In Pune. So I get this thing, Sun Mugarka telling me, Jay wants to speak to you. So Jay gets on the phone and says, Myra, I admire the work that you're doing, building this great enterprise, finding the best young people. They feel very motivated and so on. But I have just got this postcard from a woman and this is what she says. So of course, made the excuse, sir, you know, we're short of capital. You know, we will get there one day. We will build toilets and all the rest of it. But right now, we've got to use our capital for machines and not toilets. 
and so on. But he then said, you know, you know what you're missing maybe? You're looking for the best. And the multiplier of having the best person in terms of how effectively your capital will be used is so high. Why are you? Hmm? So build the toilets if you have to do that. So this woman was Sudha Murthy actually. Yeah. She was employed by Tata's then. And she um, and uh, Narayan Murthy have been so gracious always to say that GRD Tata built two IT enterprises in India. One, of course, was TCS, uh, whose great leader we just lost, FC Kohli. And the other, uh, Narayan Murthy was say, was Infosys. Because if Sudha hadn't been given the job, Narayan Murthy had no money, and they yeah. could not have started uh, Infosys. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Arun, I'm now going to switch to questions from the audience. Yes. And the, um, there is a practice in this, um, in this um, series to give prizes to the best five questions. Um, they're given the Tata Click uh, prize. So I have the next five questions to you are from the winners of the Tata Click prize. Okay. So the first question is from Dr. Mukesh Batra. And he says, how have the Tatars built a strong value-based organization over the years, in spite of corruption all around them? That's an easy one. You don't need to take it down. Oh, <laughs> how, yeah. have, how have the Tatars built a strong value-based organization over the years, in spite of corruption all around them? It was, uh, you know, role modeling is uh, the only way you teach values. You can't teach them in English or Hindi or uh, in a classroom. It is by people see what you do when you have a tough decision to make. And I gave you some examples of what uh, uh, I, I heard Tata's did and I watched uh, Sumut Murgaakar, Nani Palkewala, like I mentioned, when they have tough decisions to take, they considered what is the ethics of what they are doing. I mean, who is benefiting? Who is being harmed? So watching leaders take those decisions was very important. And in Tata, the difference was, uh, compared to other businesses, that, like I said earlier, they were considering the impact of their decisions not just on themselves and on their bottom line, but on other stakeholders. And repeatedly, I saw this. And I was encouraged to do that. And once I do remember, and this is a personal story not in the book, when I was in charge in Pune, and uh, Mr. Antule, who was Chief Minister of Maharashtra, he called on a weekend, when we worked in weekends in Pune because we didn't have power uh, in the week, we had to work, called me and said, oh, I was wanting to call Sumanth Mulgaukar, he said, who he knew, I guess, but you know, he's on a Sunday in his holiday, I mean, on the weekend in Kandala. I'm calling you, my wife's nephew wants a job as a trainee, and so on, he's quite bright and all that. And I said, sir, well, if he applies, he'll be considered. And he said that, uh, yeah, I understand. Okay, so your standards are very high. Uh, Myra, how old are you? And I said, how old I am? Very high, very high, shabash, and all the rest. But you know what it's like? You married? I said, yes. So when your wife asks you something, you don't easily say no. You remember that? It's very uncomfortable afterwards. I know your standard, but you know, my wife is, uh, it's her nephew hmm, to do that. So I told him, I said, sir, if he were to be selected now based on the fact that he's not the best, but somebody something, when he has to go for the next promotion, which these young people want very soon, he will find that unless someone speaks for him again, he can't go. So it's far better for him to be comfortable, to be not taking a job that he doesn't get on merit. Hmm? So he said to me uh, this thing, thank you. And you know, I thought it eats off. But I told Sumul Mugakar promptly, because imagine Chief Minister telling me this. So I told Sumul Mugakar, sir, I had this call from Chief Minister Antule, and this is what he said, and I said this to him. So Myra, he said, did you think, do you think you did the right thing? I said, sir, yes, I've learned these values, you know, respect, merit, and be completely clean. Um, I, I did that. And of course, we were at that time in great things with the government of Maharashtra for our land and permissions to various things like that. He said, Myra, you know, we've asked for an extension of land to do something. 
I am sure that <laughs> we are not going to get it, but nevertheless, it's always more important to do the right thing. Doesn't matter, we'll find a way without it. So this is what he supported me, not said, oh gosh, what have you done? Of course, we did get the land, by the way, because Tata's had the reputation that, you know, you don't fool around with them. Now, I could have conceded and the reputation would have gone. The reputation would have gone. And I just had learned this value and I instinctively and solidly stuck onto it. Great. Arun, the second question is uh, from another winner of the click pr Tata Click Price, is Sohin Das. Said factory denotes a kind of assembly line manufacturing. Can leadership be taught, or does one have a leadership gene born with? Otherwise, there would be more leaders than followers. Your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, Tarun. Today, I'm glad Sohin has asked this question. You know, we are wanting to create assembly lines in India. You know, get. Uh, somebody like maybe Foxconn who put up a huge factory, large scale, people doing, you know, assembly work, assembly work. Um, assembly work has no uh, dignity in it. You're doing the same thing repetitiously, same thing. I mean, what creativity is there? How are you flowering as a human being? It's, it's menial work in a way, even though you might be air conditioned or sitting somewhere. But what are you creating there? So um, the leadership of people is not about how to manage workers on assembly lines. I mean, the slave plantations were assembly lines. You whip them and make sure they're tools and discipline. The Ford Motor Factories under Henry Ford were assembly lines. Yeah, and everyone was made to do what they had to do. And as Henry Ford said, I just wanted a pair of hands. Why do I have to get a whole human being? Because human beings have aspirations, they have emotions. They want to learn and do things differently, but I want them to keep doing what they're supposed to do and no more than that. No more than that. So learning factories cannot be merely assembly lines. But then to create a factory which is a learning factory, as I said, you've got to learn to inspire people. You've got to learn to provide them challenges which they want to, to fulfill and learn with them how to do that. So it's a leadership of learning, learning systems. And this is a lesson I've got that what India needs now very rapidly is to build more learning factories not assembly lines for low-skilled work in large numbers of people, because that is a dead end there. After they've done that and your costs go up, what will you do? You'll reduce them. You'll stop paying them any further. You'll reduce them. You'll replace them by automation. And the automation is the best answer to Henry Ford's problem. Yeah? It will just do what you're supposed to do. It has no emotions, no feelings. There's no human being attached to it. So we can't go that path to our industrialization. We've got to create jobs and pathways for young people and older people also to learn and keep earning more because they're learning more. Thank you. Thank you. Arun. The next question from another Tata Click winner is Jaydev. Um, through most of its history, the Tata group has been led by a member of the Tata family. Now that leadership has gone out of the family, will the group's value system change? Look, I, this is a, a hypothetical uh, a question, hmm? but I would answer it in this way, Tarun. What do you mean by leadership of the group? As I said, Sumant Mulgaukar was as much a leader yeah. of the Tata group as you might say GRD was. Yeah? And GRD was to say this. This is in my book. I quoted GRD saying about Sumant Mulgaukar that after Jamshed Ji Tata, the person who had the same spirit of building Indian enterprises he didn't claim it for himself, GRD. He said it was Sumant Mulgaukar. So yes, so these are leaders. And I told you about values. I mean, I was talking about Nani Palkiwala's values. He was not family. Sumant Mulgaukar was not family. So these were people who had these values. And certainly, in a very small way, I was learning those same values, though I'm not family or Parsi. You can. We Indians can have the same values. Great. The fourth, uh, next question is from... Yoshi Rao, it is well known among business professionals that Tata Group executive salaries are lower than those of other companies. Why then do Tata companies manage to attract top managerial talent? You know, what do you work for? Do you work for money or do you work for doing something good with your life, becoming 
better, more capable, and get more satisfaction in your life. And you don't get satisfaction by more money in the bank. You get satisfaction by what you do every day. The sense of a, a fulfillment that there's something that I wanted to do very well yesterday or last year I could not. I've learned to do it. Look, I can do it now. I'm becoming uh, a greater, better person. That is the satisfaction, the best satisfaction. And so, as Sumun Mugaka also said, so long as people are getting this satisfaction, they won't crave for more money. Yes, so there is, talking to the economists here, there is an economic advantage in creating an atmosphere and people are seeking their fulfillments, not in the salaries that you give them, but in, as I said, the opportunities to learn that you provide them. And economically, you're better off both ways. A, you have to pay less. And B, by what they do, they improve your competitiveness. So that's how you become a competitive enterprise without having to pay the highest salaries. And I fear that uh, sometimes our um, senior leaders take the easy way out. You can throw money and solve the problem. You know, it's harder to build an enterprise in which there's the spirit of challenge, the spirit of learning, the spirit of meeting your own goals of excellence with the society around you. It doesn't expect that you want to even, but you do that for your satisfaction. To create that doesn't require money. It requires leadership, like we discussed. And build that, and then you become an economically very successful enterprise also. Okay, the fifth question from a Tata Click a prize winner is Dinesh Hathai. Tata is seen as a rather conservative company. Would you say that leadership styles have changed or are they still in a conservative mode? You know, this word conservative, yeah. I'm saying Tata's were forerunners and still are. Okay. The people who stay with the present paradigm who are stuck in the rut are the conservative people. Right now, the conservatism is about how business should be run. We've talked about it, you know. You know, it's, it's about uh, making more money for our shareholders and then maybe you better pay your CEO and others also a part of those gains because uh, otherwise they'll not give their best or make a noise. And this doesn't go all the way down to the workers, of course. So it is that what people will say modern innovative paradigm of doing business. And you would say Tata's conservative. I'm saying actually Tata's are innovators in how to create enterprises that are good for society that are good for the people who work in them. That is the innovation. They are not conservative. This idea that the business of business should be only business and the business is only in economic enterprise is a very conservative idea. It's about time we changed out of it. This was an idea started by the East India Company about you know, getting investors together and putting some money in something down there and making profits and distributing it amongst your investors. It's gone on in the Chicago school about uh, Milton Friedman, the business of business is only business. This is a conservative idea. We need, in this 21st century, uh, these innovators' ideas, the startups' ideas, to become more mainstream. So there's, I'm going on to some other, one or two other questions. We have about five, six minutes left. Is it healthy for corporates and governments to work together? The perception amongst the lay public is that of being wary of such a nexus. This question is from Lee Francis. Yeah, um, you know, Tarun, uh, when I was in the planning commission, we were pushing very hard the idea of PPP. That's a public-private partnership and into uh, infrastructure, into uh, healthcare, into schools, PPP. It was public-private partnership. Now, these are all investments, facilities, schools, hospitals, roads, which are for the people. And in the design of the, the contracts, we were forgetting the people, the needs of the people. So it was people, it should be people first, then public, which is the government, then private, and then partnership. There's a fourth P, and I'm putting that fourth P first. We are seeing this, Tarun, very much today, that with the farmers' unrest, you know, you can make policies which are good for from the public perspective, that's the government experts' perspective, good for the economy, and which will be good for private enterprise also. The private enterprise is the engine that will produce the growth. 
But what about the people who are affected by those decisions? And by the way, in the case of the farmers' enterprise, they are also private people, but they are not big corporations. They are all private. These are really entrepreneurs. I mean, they are not the government, and they are up in arms saying, "Why don't you ask us what is good for us? What is good for us? You know, we need reforms. Of course, they need reforms. The other people who are suffering the most, which is why we are thinking of reform. But have you asked them?" Where the shoe pinches and what would be good changes, which would help them? No, we are consulting experts from the, I would say, the economics side, which is you know, economics views, or the corporations who run big things, and say, how would you do this? And so it's, it's returned to being a government-private partnership, and the people are out of it. So we have to have, in many things in this country, the people's views included equally. And you are. Uh, uh, I have been a chairman of WWF and are a trustee of it, and you know this is a struggle right now that we are talking about the impact of projects on the environment. We have a system in this country that you should listen to the communities. You must have an environment impact analysis, and the communities are asked, okay, "What matters to you in your place? The hill matters because there is a temple. Maybe it matters to you, or some pond because there is some special fish which your community is used to fishing. You know these things particularly matter, and therefore designing the project." we must consider those no expert economist with numbers is going to be able to know that they have to be there but the thing is say no it takes a long time to consult people it becomes messy they speak in their own languages why don't we use some you know good engineering economic language and we can decide what's good for the people we please must include the people as the center for all our action good um uh, question from hero mirchandani The argument for diversity is so convincing. Why don't most organizations still get it? Um, diversity, you're talking about for women, right? Like I also mentioned, why don't most organizations get it? Yes, uh, you know, we'd be surprised. I'm learning. I learned that time also that my bias against um, not having women. I did the. Obvious argument that it costs something to have a woman, but as Yadi put it, actually you gain a lot by having a woman. Then what is it that has come in our way not to have thought about at the very first time that we must be having women and therefore let's provide for it? But there is a long-standing bias against uh, women for sure in society. It goes five thousand years. Uh, this bias. It's very hard to get over it. It's very hard. And I might say to you, Tarun, when we got our efforts for uh, in CII also. to you know empower women and to make them join our enterprises what do we train them in we train them to do men's work as well as a man can do it huh? then you belong in this man's enterprise in fact they come dressed in suits you know leave their sarees out because they want to look like a man what we need really is the way a woman thinks the world needs the way a woman thinks which is very inclusive which is community oriented it is not about dominating women like to include many care for all the children equally the father may say this fellow is a useless son you know whip him and make him work harder the mother will still care for him yeah and help him out so we need a feminine way of thinking and we don't have that we got a masculine way and we try to include women into our masculine way as you know in cii we had many women executives and actually we had a 50-50 balance at the end and it was remarkable to have that balance because they brought so much quality and different perceptions to the to the work a uh, question from r mistri with tata going international will leadership conform to different national values a tough question i i mean i've seen this subsequently because i left tata in 89 i had been part of the international ventures of tatas before them which as i mentioned were in singapore and malaysia and uh, we kept to our values there and uh, we found that uh, our local managers our local shareholders there learned that if they let us live by our values their enterprises there were very respected uh, in their communities and the you know, local shareholders got more respect in the communities so one must carry one's own values from india and i'm saying is that the world's culture in terms of values the tata values the world's culture is not like that the world's culture is very much about business values businesses for business so tatas in joining the world have to be you know working with those values but not losing yours so 
yes, the way Tata's operate today is not the way Tata's operated in India when I was with Tata's. And it's a good thing because you must you know, adjust the ways you work, but without losing your core values. The core values are honesty, trust, caring for everybody. Don't lose that. Are Tata's losing that when they are in England or in the UK? Are they losing that when they operate elsewhere? To my knowledge, not so. Because as we were welcomed when we went into the steel business in the UK and into Jaguar, because they said some values are being brought by this organization. Yes, the workers welcomed us, the unions welcomed us, and we stayed there very long in spite of very hard times for the companies, for Tata Steel certainly. This shows the commitment that we're not going to let down people so easily as others would do. Other people come and cut costs immediately, hold it up or sell it off at some price, and cut your costs, not Tata's, even there. I don't see a dilution of values of Tata's when they've gone global. I don't see it. One last question from Anil Khandarwal. How, Tata's, how did Tata deal with toxic leaders, especially at the senior league, at the levels? How values for people were upheld? Toxic leaders, how did Tata deal, how were values upheld? <laughs> Anil Khandarwal. Yes, uh, two parts. I have one story in my book about a great uh, leader which Sumun Mulgankar relied upon to build our engineering enterprise. But one value he did not have, which was very dear to Tata's, was that he didn't treat others with respect. He took away people's dignity, sort of whipped them to shame them, to punish them, to get the best out of them. And this was not a Tata value. So in that, Sumut Mulgankar put the man on the line and said, we need you, but not that badly. If you don't change, the way you treat other people, you will be let go. And uh, he, as I tell the stories there, was very firm about it. He constrained the person and reduced the role of the person progressively to leave it as a pure engineering advisory role and made the person a, a very senior person too. But other times, I know with Suman Murgaukar, we found instances of a person was alleged to have been corrupt in some way, I would get a call from Sumut Murgaka, find out, and if it is true, give the person a chance quickly, and if it's true, quickly. If the senior person, then you know we have a right to ask the person to resign or leave or fire the person. Work is, of course, a longer process. But at all times, this will not be tolerated. Yes? This will not be tolerated, that people are arming others or corrupt in the more usual fashion also. I think Anil Dharkar is going to join us now, but as he as he comes on to conclude this session, Arun, I want to say something to you, uh, going back to your first story about St. Stephen's and joining Tata's instead of government. And of course, in between, you have also been in government. You are symbolic of something I deeply believe in, that people from outside government can bring about positive change in a country, in an organization, in an institution. And uh, I'm great. I'm, I'm so happy to be with you this evening. Over to you, Anil. Well, thank you so much, Arun and Tarun, for a most wonderful conversation, uh, full of insights and lovely anecdotes. Uh, I think everyone who is listening in today must go and get your book, Arun. Uh, before we conclude, uh, since we are at the almost at the end of the year, but that's the book. That's the book. It's a I don't miss your book again. Thank with you. The, with the Tata Blue on on the cover, I was saying that since it's the end of the year, and uh, I thought it'd be nice if we conclude with both of you giving us a selection of your favorite books, which you would recommend to our listeners today. Uh, say three books each. Who wants to go first? So, Tarun, you go first. Okay, so I have uh, just read recently one amazing book by Lieutenant General Satish Dua, uh, retired from the army in earlier this year, India's Brave Hearts, the untold stories of the Indian army. It's an amazing book. It is it is a book which will make you cry, and but it will cry with joy. Um, 
second a fiction book of fiction daniel silver the order and the last one which has come out very recently so all of you know about it it's 750 pages but it is wonderful reading and i just went through it like a bullet barack obama a promised land that's a very wide choice lovely lovely choice yes thank you and thank you yes arun your turn thank you um, uh, uh, anil i i read a lot i probably uh, read two or three books a month and with the lockdown time i've had a chance to reread some books and i picked up books recent books that i feel are talking have talked very strongly to the challenges of our times so i'm going to recommend um, uh, suggest three books one of them is called the empire of cotton the empire of cotton a global history by swen beckert if we want to understand uh, globalization and global capitalism how it has come about and what are the forces that continue to drive it i would urge it's a long book 500 pages extremely well written by this economic historian from harvard but yeah. india would come in there does india come in there oh, or very strongly and you know this is what insights came and now with the farmers movement you begin to understand how governments along with corporations do things which harm the people and it was the government of england along with merchants from england who were telling the government of england what they should do so that well they could make more profit and they'd be able to pay more taxes in england and what happened then to to india hmm? the other is well then to give more heart and hope so what do we do is this amazing book by two indian authors um the book is called the web of freedom jc kumarappa and gandhi struggle for economic justice by these two uh, uh, persons from i am bangalore venu madhav govindu and deepak malgam we need a new economics we are talking that after this covid let's not recover the old normal economists have been saying since the financial crisis we need a new normal economics we have the outlines of this in this amazing book of economics by it's about kumar appa was a great economist worked with gandhi ji all his life and the people around him at that time the ideas and they tried them in the practical ideas in india we need to recover deep fundamental insights so that's second one the third one is a uh, uh, a friend common friend of tarun's and mine michael sandel please read everybody the tyranny of merit what became what's become of the common good now we liberals well educated liberals are having a hard time all over the world not just in india in america also and michael sandel puts very well we need to examine our own thinking yeah the tyranny of merit what's become of the common good and as i said so many can add a fourth one just last one i'm so glad you mentioned uh, sandel's book because we had him during our uh, mumbai lit fest Yes. talking about this very book and it, it was quite amazing uh yeah it's available on youtube and uh, so now uh, all of you it's listening in book anil there's a fourth book please we talking about technology 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 and science will solve all our problems i reread uh, it's a recent book by the dalai lama his holiness called the universe in a single atom the convergence of science and spirituality it's so elegantly written and you as you know has he's conversed with nobel laureates in physics and biology over the years and his profound insights that we must use technology and science but how right thank well, you well we've gone over time but it's been worth it and worth listening to both of you fantastic conversation as i said earlier thank you so much arun mai and tarun das and those of you listening in uh, not only are you going to buy arun mehra's book but you have recommendations of seven other books which you can dip into we will see all of you soon in the next tata literature live business shastras goodbye thank you thank you anil thank you tarun bye bye thank you